Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to go over the Russia and Ukraine conflict and some of the things that have been happening along the digital and information war behind the scenes. Some of what has been reported is this is like the most online digital war in the history of you know human society where a lot of the videos are coming out real time over social media. Uh, even Russian troop movements have been reported and, and looked at through open source intelligence on Google Maps. And behind the scenes, there's a lot of cyber and information conflicts that are happening. And for companies that are trying to figure out whether or not they want to choose a side or do something about it, a lot of companies, this is the first time they've ever had to act in a manner like this where they're suspending services to a major country in the world. And I think it's important to say that even if you're neutral, there's a lot of uproar and pressure on companies to do something because if you're neutral, you're essentially taking a side in the public. A lot of tech companies specifically have pulled out of Russia. Almost all the social media Companies have pulled out like Meta, Snap, Reddit, and TikTok. A lot of major manufacturers like Apple, Dell, Google, Samsung, Microsoft, we have all pulled out of Russia as well. Even the the domain registers like GoDaddy, Namecheap, they also have either asked sites to be moved like in the case of Namecheap, which it's actually kicking Rustomer, Russian customers off the platform with the exception of dissidents and anti-war sites. And then GoDaddy is just completely removing the .ru and the .ru.com top level domains from their registrar. And then there was some other news like the U S based Internet backbone companies like Lumen Tech, formerly known as CenturyLink, then Cogent Communications, they disconnected their networks from Russia. So they're not routing any internet traffic to Russia, which doesn't necessarily disconnect the comp- the country from the internet, but it definitely puts a lot more congestion on the backup backbone providers. You guys who listen to the show, you know that Adam and I are employees at Microsoft and we can give a little bit of insight onto specifically what we've done as a company to try to take a stand against what's happening in Ukraine. Adam, do you want to go over some of that? Yes. So, and as just as another mention to um, Microsoft does not have editorial uh, oversight of the show and and we do this the show outside of work so it's not a a work function but we always do like to to highlight that as obviously it's important for our listeners to know um, as it may color some of our conversations so I I think all of the tech companies have acted very honorably in how they have um, dealt with the the situation taken a stand right and 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 made it clear um, where they're throwing their support behind. And so one of the things Microsoft has done since even before the kinetic war began has been aiding the Ukrainian government in understanding the cyber attacks that have been perpetrated against it, giving them warning, giving them intelligence, uh, helping protect and block against those zero day attacks from state sponsored threat actors as much as possible. So there's been that ongoing support to the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian military, um, to, to help uh, have visibility of those attacks and have um, notification of them as well. And then as far as Microsoft does operate some 
uh, news sites and and some semi kind of social media sites like Microsoft News and and the uh, MSN landing page, and then also the Bing search engine, and have used uh, those platforms to drop support for state sponsored media from Russia, like RT, Russia Today, um, Sputnik news content, that's all been removed from all of those sources I previously mentioned. And then they've been really deranked in Bing so that if you're directly searching for them, yeah, they'll pop up. But otherwise, uh, if you just do a more generic search, they won't, they won't filter up. So kind of cutting off their ability to spread pro- propaganda and and potentially fake news um, regarding what's going on. And, and so initially, th- this is a bit of a, a change. We had initially said that we would continue to support uh, Microsoft sales and services in, in Russia. Um, we've, uh, we've actually done business there for like 30 years, uh, going back to the founding foundation of the Russian Federation after the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and after it became really clear, you know, that, that lots of companies were really um, moving to a point of taking a stand against doing further business there, we did join with many other American and Western and, and really global um, organizations in suspending uh, those operations in the Russian Federation at this time as well. So continuing to support um, customers there who need support, obviously, but not not trying to make new sales right now or anything like that or, or operate more services than need to be. And then just kind of an internal programming note too, that I, I saw this the other day. Uh, we have a, a really generous matching program for donations or, or other charitable giving at Microsoft. And, and that's always been a one-to-one match. So if I were to donate, you know, a hundred dollars to my local YMCA, Microsoft will kick in a hundred bucks as well, which has always been fantastic. For certain aid organizations right now that are aiding Ukrainian people um, who might be refugees or might be away from their homes or, or going through some really hard times, uh, Microsoft's actually matching at a two to one ratio right now. So if I kick in a hundred towards some of those select Ukrainian aid organizations, the company will kick in another two dollars on top of that. So, or sorry, two hundred dollars on top of that. So that's been um, really, really helpful as well as uh, Microsoft employees charitably give to support the uh, the refugees there of the um, Ukrainian people. So that's kind of specific to the, the Microsoft response on uh, this whole, I guess we're calling it a conflict. I mean, basically an invasion might be a better word, but um, hopefully that's a good summary. Just an off show notes comment I heard today that McDonald's was pulling out and that's also fairly symbolic because as you mentioned, Microsoft's been operating there for 30 years, 30 plus years. And it was 1990 when McDonald's opened up its first restaurant in Moscow. And it was a big deal because it was symbolizing the opening of the Russia, Russian economy to the world. And now McDonald's has closed down all of their locations and pulled out completely um, out of Russia. And it's, kind of another symbolic gesture that Russia is now getting closed off to the world economy. So just a, a, an off notes uh, comment that I thought was interesting. A lot of security vendors have also responded favorably for Ukrainians who are going through this, this invasion. For example, one of our partners at Microsoft, Vectra AI, they are a security vendor that have different products, but right now they're offering a slate of free cybersecurity tools and services to organizations who believe they may be the targets of cybersecurity attacks um, from state-sponsored actors in Russia. If you are in a business that has employees or offices in the region, or you think that you're at a higher risk to state-sponsored attacks, you might want to reach out to some of your vendors and see if they have any type of programs like this. There's many out there that are offering things specifically for Ukrainians or you folks who do business in that area. So a lot of customers come to Adam and me about, you know, what should we be doing? In fact, there was 
this week we talked to another customer who had some concerns around what they should be doing in different assessments and having to put together a report for their leadership board members. And so let's go over just a few things strategically and tactically on what you should be doing to make sure in this time of like heightened risk of cybersecurity, what you should be doing to prepare. There was a SANS webcast earlier this week, which we'll put the link in the show notes. They go over a lot of good things, but out of that particular webcast specifically on cyber attack escalations in Ukraine, there are a couple takeaways. And the first thing is don't panic. I know that as a cybersecurity practitioner, oftentimes we think worst case scenario. So we might overreact and maybe do something to make the situation worse. So instead we should focus on the basics, make sure that we have those in place. And then second of all, the other major takeaway was pay a lot more attention to network traffic. If you're not logging it, you should start logging it. And then you should start scrutinizing it, like where the traffic is coming from, where it's going to. From a strategic standpoint, let's just talk over just a few high points on what to focus on. First of all, assume that cyber attackers are already inside your environment. We talk about all that all the time, assume breach. And so you should leverage credible cyber threat intelligence to make sure that you know if you are in a position where you might be targeted more by Russian adversaries. And if you are, you should already assume they're probably already in your networks. You should make sure that you have communications ready. We, we've we talked about having an incident response plan, and part of that plan is making sure that you have the right people to contact, right? Senior leadership, communications, marketing, legal, any type of third party, your customers, like make sure you have that stuff ready so you're not scrambling last minute to craft an email or figure out what's going on. Like you should probably have something ready to go just in case. DR, disaster recovery, right? We've talked about having a restoration plan. You should make sure that you have key assets ready to go and test those recovery plans right now in case something happens. And then third party engagements, like make sure that you have like forensics and response partners. Maybe you have an IR firm um, in your pocket, like ready to go. You're paying a retainer fee or something like that. Like make sure those, those agreements are good because you may need to use that. So just review your third party agreements for IR forensics, your insurance, cyber insurance, cyber um, security insurance, and law firms, because you might need legal res- representation if something happens. And then, of course, stay informed of the news. Listen to our podcast. Listen to um, other cybersecurity podcasts, latest news like CISA and um, other uh, industry leaders like Microsoft. We have blogs on Um, current news and events and cybersecurity attacks that are happening in that area. So that's from a high level view. I think those are some key points to just take a look at right away. Love all of this. And, and going back to, you you talked about addressing your assumptions, talked about assuming breach. And I, I just want to dig into that for a second because going all the way back to gosh, People have been saying that at least for five years now, because I know I have. You gotta assume breach. You gotta assume breach. Like, do ha, have we lost meaning of what that really looks like? Because that's like if somebody said, Hey, I think somebody's in the network right now, like what would you be doing to try to root them out? You know, what would you be doing to try to find them? Are you doing those things? Do you have tooling in place that would potentially detect lateral movement? Do you have tools in place that would detect privilege escalation? And by the way, saying we have EDR is not the answer here. Uh, You need more than that to be able to see some of the stuff like this. Oh, we have a SIM. Like, again, no. 
Target had everything in their SIM too. They still didn't know they had attackers inside their network kind of thing. So just when, when we say stuff like this, it's so easy to let it just kind of fly by and go, "Uh huh, I know. Assume breach, zero trust. Yep. Heard it all before. But like, are we actually really taking that to heart? Are we, are we behaving every day? Like there are adversaries in our network and we just don't, we just don't see them. Are we doing everything we can to discover them and eradicate them? Because for most organizations, the answer is no, you're not. And so I, I think that's, that's one of the big things here. And then just, just love all of this highlights so much of going back to the basics, doing the basics. So at Microsoft, we have what are called talking points um, when there's ever like a high visibility issue or a high visibility scenario, where as opposed to having Adam or Andy ad lib on the scenario and somebody saying, oh, that's Microsoft's official response. It's a way for us to have consistent messaging. And we, of course, have had talking points around the uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine. And a lot of those talking points I, I had a member of one of my account teams pushed back on me and say, we need to, we need to add more to this. We need to spice it up a little bit or I forget um, what this person said, but that's not the point. The whole point is it, it really got down to the guidance to customers was do the basics. And if you're not doing them yet, now's a good time to do them. Now is not the time to say the sky is falling. The sky is falling and start implementing a whole bunch of stuff haphazardly. Now is the time to double and triple check that the, basics, your house is in order because that's what you can really control right now. Um, to act like all of a sudden, like, Oh, well, we should take security seriously now. Like, obviously not. Like if you haven't been doing it all along, now is not the time to start, but now is the time to check your locks, check your windows, make sure they're locked, you know, make sure your car is locked, those sorts of things. Like the basic stuff here, are you doing MFA, right? Like super simple. Um, if you're, if you're still not, then turn that on. Do you have basic authentication turned off in exchange online? If not, you should do that. You know, this is, these are like the simple things, the, the back doors that are unlocked that you can just let them walk right through. And, and these are the things we're talking about, not, not panicking, not doing a whole bunch of crazy stuff, not locking everything down to an insane degree. It's, it's doing the basics. And so Andy, you talked about the customer we, we spoke to this week and they were asking about like, Hey, as part of our support agreement, do we have access to like any sort of assessments, like doing a security health check on on-premises active directory, just making sure we're not doing anything crazy there. And it's like, yes, as part of your support agreement with Microsoft, you have unlimited access to assessments on on-premises active directory, as well as Azure active directory, as well as Microsoft 365. Let's get all those going. That's great. That was really smart when that CISO came to us, Andy, and said, hey, I want to make sure my house is in order. That is exactly right. Find any configuration issues, any any obvious things. Like I said, windows left unlocked, back doors left open. Those are the kind of things we're looking for right now. Not going out and buying a whole bunch of new tools and slapping them in, you know? Um, and so I, I, I like that as well. The sky is not falling here, um, but certainly we need to do our due diligence and like you said, stay informed, uh, dot your I's and cross your T's. A couple other points that I found as I was researching this topic that people can think about are B2B entry points. If you have any type of B2B, like if your other business partners get compromised, maybe that will flow over to your network if you have a B2B connection somewhere. VPN connections, if you're still using them, obviously you want to check those network logs and make sure, maybe even lock it down to um, to consider where those people are coming from. Uh, if at all possible, implement MFA or 2FA on VPN connections. Many companies use single factor on those. So if there's any ability in your VPN client to onboard to a SAML IDP you should do that and implement MFA on those. And it's worth mentioning patching. We really, really should be diligent about patching right now. Like everything should be up to date. So that means looking at both operating systems and applications 
like browsers. I know we've talked about updating your browsers and different applications breaking. I mean, that should be heavily scrutinized and understood the risk that out-of-date browsers can pose for a company. If there was ever a time to scream the sky is falling and use it as an excuse to do something, use it as an excuse to deploy all those patches you're sitting on that you're not sure of. You know, get them pushed out. And if stuff breaks, it breaks and deal with it then. But you're better off than leaving leaving it wide open. And then the other thing too on VPN, this is interesting. And, and I do not think this was not communicated as uh, anything related to this. But just as an internal kind of note, Microsoft just recently made a configuration change for our Windows PCs that are managed by MSIT where they no longer connect to VPN automatically. So they have moved it to a model where it's manual VPN connection. And the reason why is we are so far along in our zero trust journey that almost every single application that is or formerly was internal is now exposed through Azure AD app proxy which means it has its own conditional access policy that applies to it, which means every single time I access that app, even our time and absence reporting app, which is like this ancient app that I think was written for IE4, it is still validating like I'm on a managed trusted device, uh, my user risk is low, my sign-in risk is low, and checking that every single time before I get into it. And if there's a different internal app that's more sensitive, then it can apply additional scrutiny as well. But every single one of those apps is isolated in the sense that just because I have access to this one internal app doesn't mean I have access to this many others. And so, again, I am not advocating for you to do something crazy that you're not prepared to do right now. But just as we're on the subject of VPNs, I just thought I'd mention it. This came through recently where we have moved to a model where so far along that VPN is now opt-in if you run into something where you need it. Like I actually, I had to extend my access to um, an internal service. And so I had to go submit like a ticket through some sort of like ancient sale point instance or something. And it's on premises only. So I had to fire up my VPN, but I've been working like the last two weeks without it. So that's, that's a good goal for everybody listening to get to is make it so that your employees could do their day-to-day job day in, day out and not need VPN, Right. And, and that, that would be a helpful goal to get to. But yeah, as far as I don't want to get way off topic here, but since it came up and the timing was interesting, I thought that was interesting as well. And again, I don't think that was an MSIT response to anything. I think it was just uh, fortuitous timing, but definitely um, patching is the perfect example of that super low hanging fruit, super basic stuff that if you've been putting it off or you've been getting some pushback or you have a little hesitation, now is the time to kind of click that approve button on all those lingering patches and blast them out. That risk is probably lower at this point of breakage than it is leaving that unpatched. A couple other things to do kind of in the future or after you've validated all of the basic things that we've kind of gone over you should take a look at your internet facing attack surface. So if you are hosting any applications out yourself on the external internet, take a look at your, at least your SAS providers and, and make sure that they're doing everything. Okay. Um, evaluating your uh, capabilities like testing and simulating crisis management and incident response. And that means not only just the, the part about, doing the response, but also just making sure everyone knows their role when there is some sort of crisis. If you have any type of recovery playbooks, you know, after you validated that you do have backups and that there are secure, do a, a review of any type of continuity or recovery plans to make sure that they're up to date. And visit any type of technologies that you're doing in, in, as far as supporting your hybrid workforce, like your remote and external access points or uh, current versions of endpoint detection, right? Those are all things that you can do like after the basics. And then 
I think this one, uh, when I was researching it, I thought this was interesting. Set any type of expectations or maybe reset the expectations with senior leadership and board members on the potential for disruption of services due to a cyber attack. And then what steps are being taken to manage those risks? Because it's important that they understand if your business is not at risk, then let them know that, right? Because a lot of senior leadership sees the news, they're worried about it, and maybe you're in a industry that is probably not going to be a high value target, then your risk profile is a lot lower. But if you're in, say, for example, critical infrastructure or medical or anything that may be a high value target for state sponsored attack, then your risk profile is a lot higher and those expectations should be set and the board members and leadership should understand what might happen in a disruption of service and then what you're trying to do to to prevent all that. The other thing that the SANS webcast talked about was network traffic. And so let's just dive into that real quick. There's a, a try, um, what do you call it? Like a tripod of, uh, services that you should have as far as instant response goes. One of them is an EDR. Another one is a SIM. And then the third leg of that tripod is a network detection and response tool an NDR. And that's something that typically is usually either a physical or virtual appliance that's in line with your network, like on a spam port or something like that, and seeing all that traffic at a network level. And it includes IoT traffic. Like, for example, at Microsoft, we don't necessarily have that, but we have other tools that kind of congregate all that traffic, like with Defender for IoT and Defender for Endpoint and Defender for the Cloud, and all of that kind of aggregates it, where there are other vendors, like the partner that I mentioned, Vector AI, or other vendors like Darktrace. They have physical or virtual appliances that you put in line that do kind of the same thing. And so those tools are particularly important for analyzing your network traffic, or you could just do it old school and review like NetFlow traffic. Like if you have Cisco firewalls, NetFlow is the protocol that Cisco uses to collect IP traffic. And so you can track point of origin, destination, volume, and pass of the network. And so you're going to want to look at your edge devices, your firewalls, and any other device that controls network flow. And you can even do this if you're a small business. If you have firewalls, you can do this. And so you want to log that traffic. If you haven't enabled logging for it, you should turn it on. You shouldn't use like the built-in memory in the firewall because it's very, very short. It probably can only store a couple minutes of logs. So you're going to want to export those logs to some sort of SIM most likely. So something like Splunk or Microsoft Sentinel, right? Get a SIM. And a quick note on Microsoft Sentinel, you can get a free instance of Microsoft Sentinel. It's very, very quick. And you can even enable it and just put in the free sources. There's a lot of free sources for Microsoft services that can flow right to Sentinel that cost you no money at all to start up. Now, if you want to export your logs into Sentinel from a firewall, that will cost some money because of the storage. It has to be stored in a, in a log analytics workspace and then analyzed from there. So there is some cost for the storage because you have to host it in the cloud. But other than that, if you're, if you're just enabling it for Microsoft services, there are a lot of free information signals that can be imported into the Sentinel for no cost. So if you aren't logging your network traffic, turn it on. Make sure that you're storing it somewhere because network traffic that's aggregated and investigated over a large period of time has a lot more value than just a few minutes in like the local memory of the firewall. And then layering on some sort of SaaS application uh, network, like for example, like a CASB. So like at Microsoft, we have Defender for Cloud Apps. Or another CASB, uh, you can you can analyze the traffic that's flowing to different cloud applications as well, and then you can usually output that CASB product to a SIM as well, and aggregate all those signals together and analyze that network traffic flow. So, put some resources into logging it, making sure that it is stored, and then understanding what your normal traffic looks like and the external IPs that 
typically your users go to. So that's, in a nutshell, I think what most organizations should be doing from a network analysis and having a little bit more scrutiny right now because of the heightened cybersecurity risk. The final question that I have, and this is more of a rhetorical question. I have some opinions on it. I'll let you start, Adam, but I thought this was interesting, is should companies, security teams, CISOs, make a decision right now to stop using any type of Russian security or tech products or even Russian personnel for as part of their organization and security posture? So I have kind of two parts to my answer because there's part of me in the more idealistic part says I am so heartened by how pretty much the rest of the non-Russian world outside of, I believe it's the United United Arab Emirates and China are pretty much the only countries that have not emphatically rejected this invasion. And, you know, I, I, I remember in the, the turn of the, uh, the turn of the century when, when um, we had some of the speculation of uh, if Iraq had weapons of mass destruction or whatever. And, and there was kind of this, this discourse at the time was around like, we should do sanctions. No, we should go to war. We should do sanctions. We should go to war. And there's this perception that like sanctions are kind of this weak thing that don't really move the needle and don't hurt enough these dictators or, you know, authoritarian leaders to really make an impact. And I feel like this is different. The, the level of agreement and worldwide sanctions across not only governmental and agencies, but private business has been honestly astounding. And, and even people I think who have been dismissive in the past of the effectiveness of sanctions can't help, but almost be in awe of the cumulative effect of these sanctions on Russia. It is truly isolated them from the world. And it is, there's no way this is not going to cause massive pain for the oligarchs there, um, for private businesses there. And, and ultimately that pressure we hope might cause a change in direction. Um, I know that's been publicly emphatically denied by Putin to this date. Um, but I, I am really heartened by the power and the unity of the world against these actions and how, again, just like, I didn't expect these sanctions to get so big. I didn't expect them to get so powerful. I didn't expect private businesses, the Starbucks, the McDonald's, the Microsofts of the world to say, no, we're not going to do business there anymore and, and stand up to that. Um, and I'm, I'm heartened by that. So I think if you're a CISO, and this is where now I'm shifting to kind of the pragmatic part of it, the idealist in me says, yeah, stop using it. Absolutely. The pragmatist in me says being a business person in a business, um, obviously your goal ultimately is to support the business's goals, right? As, as a security practitioner inside corporate um, corporations anywhere, or even nonprofits anywhere. Same thing. You're still supporting the goals of the organization. And so this is where you kind of have to take a cue from your organization's leadership. And, and you can certainly have that conversation with them, with the senior leadership team, if you are a CISO. On hey, what is our philosophy on this? Are we going to kind of lay low on this? Or are we going to really emphatically uh, cut ties any way we can? Because guess what? I've got a couple of Russian-made products or, or software packages or whatever in my org, and I would be personally supportive of getting rid of them. Obviously, I'm going to need a little financial budgetary support to do that. Um, and, and I also want to make sure we're rowing the boat in the same direction. I think at most companies, that support would come. Again, just because it, it's been, again, I think shocking in a positive way how much everyone has rallied together and, and how many organizations have rallied together. But again, you kind of take your marching orders from the CEO, from the senior leadership team, and you're supporting the business. And the business is staying more, quote unquote, neutral, which, Andy, to your point, is a decision too. Well, then, then 
obviously not your really not really your place to rock the boat. So I think as always with security, you you give an advisory, um, you take an advisory role, you advise the senior leadership team that you do have those products, you are open and amenable to ripping them out in short order, but you obviously want to support the organization's goals in doing so. And if there isn't that appetite for it, I think you kind of have to say, all right, fine. And and maybe you could do it within your budget that you already control. And maybe you can do it without a big show of force. I think if, if it's within your control, then you should do it. Um, but again, you know, you got to make sure that fits in the larger cultural and, and strategic picture of the organization. So I think there's, there's a idealist part and a pragmatic part to that conversation. And, uh, like any good, uh, senior leader, you kind of have to balance both. Right. Yeah, that's well said. I, I agree with what you said there. I think the only thing I have to add is really as far as the pragmatic part, you know, the advising part. One, understand that any type of Russian security tool or, or even application is going to be undoubtedly subject to maybe some corporate espionage or compromise from state-sponsored actors. I think that is a distinct possibility, as well as certainly, just like Adam said, ripping out a particular application or product from your company does not come without an operational cost. And so there's going to be some sort of business disruption or something like that. But from a moral standpoint, you know, I think the Ukrainians, their lives have been disrupted much more than maybe your business is going to be. So well, that's that's more from a moral standpoint, but yeah, I do understand having been in a business before the financial implications and beholden to the shareholders and all of that. And so, yeah, there there may be some business implication, but the cybersecurity risk is definitely real. Like that should be something that your board members should know, right? I didn't even consider that when I gave my long winded answer. I think that makes the conversation easier because now it really does go back into under your purview, your responsibility is to secure the organization. I can no longer trust this tool to your point, Andy. I I need to replace it because given current events, this tool is no longer trustworthy. Now that's a different conversation that doesn't require somebody else to weigh in. The buck stops with you on protecting the org. And if you have tools that are untrustworthy, then they need to go. And so I think, I think that actually makes the answer relatively straightforward. Right. Because then it becomes moral as well as strategic, as well as tactical. It checks all the boxes. And as far as strategic goes, I mean, this is going to have long lasting implications on the global economy, on Russia's economy, on the ability of Russia to have business in the, with the rest of the world. And so I think if you have any type of services or products, I mean, strategically long-term, it's not going to last. I think at some point you probably will have to change it anyways. So do you have to do it now? You know, that's up to you and the board and your CEO and whoever is in a leadership position. But I think in the long term, no matter what, if you're a U.S. based company, you're probably going to have to replace these products or services at some point. So that's my thoughts on that. Any other thoughts, Adam, before we close it out? These are the the hard conversations, but also the interesting conversations that keep this industry so interesting. When we started this show now over a year and a half ago, I think Andy and I's initial concern was, would we have enough to talk about? And certainly there's been no lack of subject matter to cover uh, during our weekly recording of the show. And um, I, I don't make light of that, right? Like it's, this is serious business. It, it is a serious business. Um, and some weeks are more serious than others. And so these are, these are challenging conversations, but um, we need to have them. And, and they're, they're part of our, uh, they're part of our wheelhouse, you know, to, to do that. So, you know, our hearts are with the Ukrainian people. Um, I, I, Really, genuinely hope, um, although it's hard to to have line of sight to a 
expedient resolution to this invasion that uh, Russia would just kind of pull out and say, oops, our bad. And we could all move forward. And I, I just don't think that's going to happen for, you know, face saving reasons, if nothing else. So um, like you said, Andy, this, this really needs to factor into long term planning, because, again, we're not going to have that just kind of snap your fingers and go, oh, OK, that's over. Um, and, and so these are these are the kind of things I think we're only going to have to get more well versed in over time is including the geopolitical situation uh, of the moment into our threat assessment, into our actions. But at the end of the day, it goes back to the basics. And that's the overall message from tonight's show. Patching, multi-factor authentication, monitoring, visibility. Those are those are still the things we need to be working on all the same. And I know it gets like uh, repetitive at times. I, I talked about that with the assume breach part of it. You know, I, I kind of pulled that back out and said, hold on, what does assume breach really mean? You know, and, and those are, those are the kind of conversations we need to be having right now too, is going back to all these things we kind of say and we pair it, but are we actually taking actions that are consistent with them too? So um, kind of a downer of a show, but again, nature of our business. So I uh, hope everybody has a great week and we will talk to you the next time. And Andy, why don't you uh, wrap us up and take us home? All right. Thanks again for listening and watching our show. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you guys have any questions or topics you guys want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.